last night, line and happy night and day. Amen. Praise the Lord. Any birthdays this past week? Stephanie's saying no, so I guess there weren't any cards to send out. All right, so we are continuing on in Acts and continuing to look at the development, really, of the church, uh, led by the disciples and the apostles and uh, some of the challenges and things that they were going through, which, of course... Um, we are able to relate to because the enemy continues to do the same sorts of things today. And our guideline then is the scripture which helps us to see how did the disciples under God's direction uh, solve, resolve some of the issues and problems that were going on. And I believe we should do the same. Um, and so we have to look at scripture and see what is going on here. So we're in Acts chapter 15, but so you can turn to Acts chapter 15 and put your finger there or whatever. But I would like to read before we go there in Revelation, familiar scriptures at the end of Revelation chapter 22, uh, two verses, Revelation 22 verse 18 and 19, where it says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So we use those verses, uh, which really the scripture basically ends on, as a reminder uh, that what we have in the Bible, from beginning to end, God has placed there, and neither you nor I, or any committee or group, uh, God says that we are not to remove, and we are not to add uh, to anything that the Lord has placed there. I start there because our lesson today is specifically about that. Uh, the title that it was given is Guarding the Gospel. Guarding, protecting what is written within the Gospel. And uh, certainly, I believe that uh, Pastor John and I uh, are both are sending the message to you and that you understand very carefully that we are in a world today that uh, is seeking uh, to either ignore completely what the Bible tells or to try and manipulate and change what we see in Scripture by adding and interpreting um, in the wrong way uh, so that we have, in many Christian circles, additions, um, sort of man-made rules and regulations that get added that are, they may be um, placed in place for organizational structure of the church in some way, um, and, and so, for instance, it could be something as simple as, you know, on your tithing envelope or offering envelope, we have places that we ask you to please, you know, write properly if this is going to missions, if this is going wherever, right? You've got those, the building fund, etc. Then we have rules and regulations that we use in uh, the study when we're recording all of that information, uh, things that uh, help with the auditing at the end of the year uh, so that you know everything can be recorded properly uh, and that the information can be given out to you. So it can be something as basic as that, but sometimes as we see in scripture here, we have um, rules and regulations that people are trying to put in place that have an impact on salvation, that have an impact on a person's status uh, in that book of life, like it spoke there in Revelation, that God warned that if you mess around, my words, uh, with the scripture, then he is going to remove uh, your name or my name or that person's name from the book of life. So what we have here this, in this particular lesson in chapter 15 of Acts is an example of how the enemy tries to work. And the saddest part to me and for me, uh, with regards to this particular lesson, uh, and how sometimes the enemy works, is he often tries to work from within. Um, and that's rather disheartening uh, for me, right? That the damage it, to the Christian church is often done by 
those that are proclaiming to be Christians themselves. And so there is this destruction as the body destroys itself, in a sense, or uh, tries to weaken itself. Now, it makes sense that that's how Satan would prefer to work. And so he is always after you or I to try and uh, you know, weaken some link in the church somewhere so that then there can be schism, as the Bible speaks about, there should be no schism, no division in the body. Well, what we see this morning is schism. What we see is division. Um, and it is something that we have to constantly pray about and ask the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us so that that does not happen. All right? So, let's go to chapter 15 in Acts. Um, we know that uh, Barnabas and Paul have been ministering, and they've been traveling. That was last week's lesson. And uh, we're back, basically, in Antioch. Uh, this would be Syrian Antioch. I remember I explained to you that there is also an Antioch in what we know of today as, as Turkey, uh, more inland. But this is the Antioch in Syria that we hear most about. Paul and Silas, at this point in time, are not there. Or, you know. And in verse 1 it says... And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. All right, so what was happening? First of all, we see these were people coming from Judea, so they should have been more knowledgeable, and they came to teach. So that gives us a little bit of an inclination here that these were, you know, uh, these were people not just you know, travelers from Judea. These were probably people from within the church structure in Jerusalem. Okay? And they were coming. They came um, to Antioch, just like Paul and Barnabas came and others came. Um, and they were given the privilege to teach. In other words, they were, today we would say, they were given the right uh, to stand behind the pulpit or to stand in front of a class. Um, and they were allowed to teach. What they taught uh, wasn't false doctrine, because what they were teaching was Mosaic law. So this was Old Testament law. These were rules and regulations that God had ordained. Okay, so they were they came from the Lord, but they came to the Lord for Moses to share with the people at that time. So, what we really see in Scripture, and we shouldn't be too surprised by this, is um, a growth in spiritual understanding of, of how to worship, how to praise the Lord. Um, as God fulfills His promises from the Old Testament, we recognize Jesus comes to fulfill those promises, right? And the Old Testament rules and regulations, and we could be specific, right, regarding animal sacrifice. Well, I don't see that happening here. We don't do that anymore. So are we not Christians? Like, we're not following Mosaic law. Because Jesus came and he advances the understanding. He advances the spiritual knowledge. He fulfills the promises. And he quite literally removes many of the symbolic rituals and things that God had put in place. So these things were not wrong in the Old Testament, but God, by His wisdom, not yours and mine, right? And we have to remember that. This isn't a group of people getting together and saying, now, nah, we don't need to do that anymore, let's change it. Remember what I read in Revelation. We're not allowed to do that. But God, the author, he is allowed to move in Scripture his people along to help them, help them to grow. And so Jesus comes and he really fulfills the Mosaic law. He fulfills the rituals so that those things, as we often talk about, the veil is rent in twain, right? Now we have access 
to God by the Holy Spirit through Jesus, our intermediary, we no longer need to do all of those uh, priestly rituals. I don't have to do the physical cleansing. You know, I showered this morning, but I didn't do a physical cleansing. I'm not standing here with the garments on that God ordained in the Old Testament. Right? The robe and and uh, all of all of the different you know pieces of jewelry, right? All of the the different uh, stones on a vest. I, I don't have any of those things on because Jesus, when He came, He moves us through. I'm going to say the Mosaic law, and in a sense, all things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Okay, now. That, for some people, is and was very, very difficult. Very difficult. And what we see here is an example that we had people coming to a very young new church. And they stood before those people that, you know, God had blessed and that they were now part of the family of God. And they stood before those people and bluntly said, unless, speaking to the male population, unless you are circumcised as by the Mosaic law, you're not saved. Whoa. Sudden confusion. Can you see that? Sudden confusion, right? Wait a minute. We had Paul, we had Barnabas, we had other apostles that came in, the Holy Spirit filled us, we were saved, we're part of the family of God, and now somebody's coming and saying, no, that's not right, because you have not fulfilled this natural rule that was in the Old Testament. Okay? But you haven't done that, and therefore you're not Christians. You're not born again. So, that kind of confusion is exactly what Satan loves. Okay? Because now there's seeds of doubt, and there's seeds of fear are planted, and you know you can just hear the people, I can just hear the people talking. What, what do you mean? And we thought this, and were Paul and Barnabas not telling us the right thing? And who do we believe? Who do we, what are we supposed to do? So, then we see, verse 2, right? Then therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. So there was disagreement. And we have to recognize that there are times in the body of Christ that there are disagreements. Okay. The, the important part there is the fact that we can't, we should not stop at the disagreement. Okay. We have to work harder I have to work hard, I would encourage you to work hard, the entire body to work hard, that we don't let those disagreements divide us. Okay? Because we see that all the time. Right? This is how churches divide. This is how congregations fall apart. Right? And it's because of differences of opinion, differences in what you want to do, and some of them are critical. I'm not saying that you know there aren't and this was a critical one, right? This would sort of be, you know, if I, you know, this would be like me saying, wait a minute, we have to go back to Old Testament law or whatever. I see in the Old Testament, you know, maybe the men all have to sit in the front, the women you have to sit at the back. And if we don't do that, we're not going to heaven. Like if I were to say something like that, okay, you know, those kind of things create all kinds of distress in the body of Christ. And those things have to be resolved. So here there was disputation. There was discussion. All right? And it tells me that they had no small dissension and disputation. So there, was, there were definite like, battle lines were drawn. Right? Paul and Silas says, no, that is not correct. And then you can hear the other people say, wait a minute, that's what we see in the Old Testament. You know, we follow the Old Testament law. So now how are we going to resolve that? What are we going to do? Okay, And it says, 
uh, then that they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them, so both sides, okay, so those that came from Judea to proclaim that they had to follow the laws of circumcision, and, and then Paul uh, and, and Barnabas, it was decided, wait a minute, we, we have to go to a higher authority. Okay. Now we understand the highest authority is God. Absolutely. Okay. But here, what we see is high authority within the church in Antioch, Paul and Barnabas and even these others that came, right? They could not agree. In a sense, they couldn't agree on interpretation of the scripture, right? Where does this start? Where does this stop? What do we have to follow? Okay, they couldn't agree on that, all right? So I'm sure that they went to prayer, but in addition to that, they also went to the higher authority within the church. Now, what that means is that people had to, and today I believe we still have to, respect the higher authority in the church. Okay. And so they went to that higher authority, which at that point in time was centered in Jerusalem, right? Because it tells me they went and certain others, still in verse 2, should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So they took this specific question to Jerusalem, to the apostles, to those that were there, the elders that were there. And being brought on their way by the church, so the church sanctioned the journey. Okay, let's go, we're going to send them. They passed through Phoenice and uh, Samaria, declaring the conversation of the gen uh, conversion sorry, of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. So while they traveled, they were still testifying, they were still doing God's work, and when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So in Jerusalem, we still had this sect of Pharisees, right, the Jewish Pharisees, who were still proclaiming and saying to the apostles and disciples, no, we are still, we need to follow the Old Testament law. Okay? And very specifically here with regards to circumcision. And so this was still happening. And actually, even still today in some Jewish circles, and certainly it was happening here, you know, in, in, the, in Bible time, when a Gentile, let's say somebody of my age, if I were a Gentile, converted to Judaism, right, I would still, if I wasn't circumcised, need to be circumcised, right? I would still go through the procedure um, to make that happen because they were following the laws that Moses, that God had given to Moses, and, and that's what they were doing, all right? And so here we have now still great division, right? And we might assume a little bit that um, those that came from Judea, back in verse 1, were perhaps of that same sect of the Pharisees. Okay? They certainly believed the same thing. Okay? And so there was, again, contention there. And verse 6, and the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. So, um, process here. Somebody came, they came before the apostles and the elders, they presented, they had their conversation, the sect of the Pharisees present their uh, belief, their understanding, and in verse 6, we believe what this really refers to now, the apostles and elders came together. They then separated themselves from the larger group to have conversation, to discuss the matter. And again, I believe that certainly prayer would be a part of that particular time to consider that matter, okay? And then they come back in to a general conversation in verse 7, and when there had been much disputing, okay, again, so lots of conversation, lots of looking at the different sides, okay? Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us 
that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Now that's an interesting section of scripture. I would encourage you to read that over a few times, right? Because really what we see here, first things, let, let me just draw your attention to a few things. In verse 7, Peter says, God made choice. That's so, it's wonderful, and it's important, and it's something all of us have to remember. Right? Who's leading the army? Who's leading the church? Who is the one who makes the ultimate decisions? Right? And we reckon we have to believe and we see God. We work through Moses, right? But Moses was a mouthpiece. Moses was a vessel God moved through. And here God's moving through Peter. And we see in the in Acts God moving through other disciples, right? If you don't believe that it is God moving through these people, then you, I, or any that don't believe that, we have a big problem. Big problem. Okay. And so we have to not only believe, but see God moving that way. That's how God moves. Through his people, right? And Peter makes it clear that God made the decision, God made choice, that they should go to the Gentiles. Peter says, that wasn't my choice. And that wasn't our choice as a council, or a group of disciples or elders. This was God's choice that we go to them in the first place. And then he continues to build, right? And God, again, very important in verse 8, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. So what, what Peter is building here is evidence showing that, hey, before these people were circumcised, God said, go to them. Before they were circumcised, before they were taught any of the laws of the Old Testament, God gave them the Holy Ghost. Just like we've received it, right? Verse 9, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. So here we see the importance of faith. And if I jump a little bit, verse 11, we see the importance of grace, right? Because it says, but we believe that, and so the believing is the faith part. We believe that through the grace of the Lord, Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Not through the actions, not through the laws, but through faith and by grace are we saved. That's the message here that Peter was reminding the disciples and the elders and the Pharisees and reminding these people that's how salvation happens. And that's such a critical piece, but often that's a stumbling piece because people like to be able to say, you have to do this, 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 and this, and then you'll get into heaven. Okay? No. We have to believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior, and we have to have faith that because of his death and his blood, now when I ask him to come into my heart, he comes in and he cleanses me. My name is written in the Lamb Book of Life if I accept him. And then I follow what he has taught. Okay? But not the other way around. And see, the people who came to Antioch said, you can't be saved until you're circumcised. That would be like me saying, I'm sorry, um, you can't be saved until you've given at least $10,000 in offering. Just as a, an example, right? Or you can't be saved until you've said, 
uh, you know, so many Our Father's prayers uh, going on your knees on the steps, front steps of the church. Or you can't be saved until I've seen you, you know, working in the garden. Thank you, Brother Maring and Brother Brian, who've been working and, and trimming, right? You know, we, I'm sorry, unless you come out for a church cleanup, you can't be saved. For those you would think that oh, those are silly examples, but it's, they're not that far off. Okay, it was a human action, circumcision, that they were talking about, and they were linking that to salvation. And Jesus said, Jesus said, no. Okay, it's now by grace through faith, right, that you believe in me, the Son of God, and you see my shed blood and my resurrection that now you have that opportunity again for eternal life. And so Peter is reminding them, right, how God makes us all, in that way, part of the family of God, right? When he says in verse 9, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith, right? So God didn't look and say, oh, the Holy Spirit can't fill that brother because he's not circumcised. But the Holy Spirit can fill that one because he is. God didn't look at it that way. He made no difference. Right? Once they had given their hearts to the Lord, then God was there to save them. Right? So in verse 12, let's continue on. Then all the multitude kept silence. Remember, before this, what were they doing? Debating and arguing and discussing. Right? There is a time for silence. Because in the silent time, that's a time for each individual to consider. Each individual to pray. Because that's important. Okay? Because we all need to seek that same spirit. And we all have to ask that same spirit to speak to all of our hearts. Collectively and individually. That's what binds us together. That same Spirit of the Lord, the blood that flows from the cross that has saved us all. So they kept silent and then gave audience to Barnabas and Paul. So Peter finished speaking, okay? And then Barnabas and Paul begin to speak after this silent time, declaring that miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. So more evidence, right? They're saying again, well, wait a minute. If this is all hinging upon circumcision, which they're not circumcised, then why would God be moving in their midst? And he was. So they gave the evidence, the testimony. And after they had held their peace, so now Barnabas and Paul stopped, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, here hearken unto me. So they kind of take their turn. Simon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take them out, uh, sorry, to take out of them a people for his name. Now this is an interesting verse. I, I, this, this is a, a quite interesting, because if you stop and think about it, who or what were the children of Israel before God chose them? They were Gentiles. They were unsaved, right? Just like all of us. Before God comes and knocks on your door, before we accept, we're all sinners. And we're still sinners saved by grace. And so Simon makes this reminder, right, in a sense, that all of God's children, that he calls by his name, he, he picked them out of the Gentile tribes right, that were there before. And to disagree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this I will return. So now that he goes, he looks at scripture. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up. That the residue, this is an important verse, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord. And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doth all these things. So, you see, in God's plan, the calling of the Gentiles to be among the children of God, right, 
In other words, God's plan that the word of God, the gift of salvation, go forth to all, anyone who will accept. But all have the right to hear it. And that, of course, is God's great commission, right, to us. I don't choose. I'm going to share the gospel with this person and not with that person, based on how they look, right? or based on a physical attribute. And again, this is all linking back to the circumcision at this point in time, right? So that you see, there's still a group within the church at this time who says, well, the word of God is only for those that are... At first, it was just for the Jewish. Okay? Now, well, okay, if we're going to stretch it to the Gentiles, let's make sure the Gentiles are following all the Jewish laws and rules. So they have to be circumcised like we are. Okay? So you see, they're trying to, to uh, make all of those people still follow Jewish tradition still follow Jewish law. Okay? Um, where God says, no, you have to follow me. God says, follow me. Not what people say. Okay? And, and so that's really important that we understand that. Okay? And, and so all are called. Now, not all answer, but all are called. Okay? Knowing, or known unto God, verse 18, are all his works from the beginning of the world. Therefore, my sentence is that we trouble them not, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Trouble them not. Let's not confuse them. Okay? Let's not bother them in a sense. But, that we write unto them that they may, and then we're going to get into this next part here in a second. Okay. Uh, let, let me say this. You see, we understand, and we should understand, that God's still working on us. I'll make it very personal. God's still working on me. And some people would say, well, wait a minute. You're a pastor. Yes, God has called me to be a pastor. But that doesn't mean that he's not working on me. He's still working on me all the time. Showing me fault, showing me failure, showing when the carnal jumps to the surface when it shouldn't and it needs to be crucified, showing me where my faith needs to increase, always showing me things, right? And, and it should be my desire, it is, it should be your desire that God continues to do that, even though sometimes it's hard. We'd like to think we're perfect or we're finished. But we're so far from that, all of us, right? And so what, what, we, what we see here, you see, is that we have to recognize when somebody comes and is beginning the journey, everything that God has revealed to me or to you, those of us that have been walking on this road with the Lord for years, where God has delivered, and God has taught us and shown us how to grow closer and closer to Him. These are amazing lessons. But we can overwhelm, if we're not careful, newborn children of Christ. Those newly into the family of God. We can overwhelm them, if we're not careful. <clears throat> What is the most critical thing when a soul walks through the doors of a church or when God brings a soul to your front yard, to your driveway, when you have an opportunity to speak to somebody in a parking lot? What is the most critical thing? What do we want first? That they give their heart and life to Jesus. That's the most critical, the most important thing, right? Are you saved? Do you know how to be saved? Do you serve a risen Savior? Do you know what Jesus did for you? Most important. That's the message of the gospel. And, you know, that part, when we see here in Scripture, you know, these references to not trouble these Christians in Antioch or bother them with all of these Old Testament requirements, 
is basically, you know, that same sort of thing to say, let's not overwhelm them. And I, I need you to go backwards a little bit here. Go back to verse 10. Let me read verse 10 again. What did Peter say? Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Now what's he talking about, that yoke? He's talking about the law. And notice he says, neither that they weren't able to bear it, right? Neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. In other words, he's looking at them and he's saying, none of us could keep all of these laws all of the time. They were cumbersome, in a sense, just like a yoke. They were heavy upon our necks. That's quite a statement. And don't be offended. I didn't say it. They said it here. In the scripture. Right? Peter says that here. Right? He says that here to all of these elders and disciples. Right? And what he's really trying to do here is remind them that Jesus comes in a sense to set even God's people free from these things. So rather than this morning, you being at home worrying about finding the perfect goat or the perfect dove or the perfect uh, sacrifice, rather than looking at the natural pieces of that, God now wants us to focus on the spiritual pieces of that. Okay. How's your heart this morning? Right. What, what, how close are you to God this morning? See, because people can get lost in the physical stuff. All of us. It's easy to do. But our focus really needs to become the spiritual piece. The focus needs to become, uh, you know, how are we walking with the Lord? Not, uh, how do I look this morning? Is my hair perfect? You know? Is, is my tie straight? What if my tie is like this? Does it change the word of God? I would suggest to you it doesn't. They didn't wear ties here. And I'm not saying that I'm taking off my tie. Okay? But what I'm telling you is we can get stuck looking at the natural stuff. Okay? And then we forget about the spiritual, which is the more important piece. Okay? And, and, and I'm not putting down respect. I believe in that. I'm not putting down, you know, the, the requirements that in our culture we might see as being important and we have decided these are the things that we're going to follow. Okay. But, you know, they wore sandals. And there are women in the church that wear sandals. How would you feel if I wore sandals? Some of you, some people might, Lord, I apologize, I might just say some people might spend the whole service talking about my sandals and my feet rather than listening to what the Lord has to say. Some pastors sometimes go to an extreme, I'm not suggesting that I would do that, but to wake up their congregations. I remember listening to a pastor who told the story, he did the whole sermon from on top of a ladder. He took a big ladder, you know, put it on the platform, and sat on top of the ladder and preached the whole sermon from there. Just to sort of say to the people, you know, like, like what are you looking at? What's your focus? What's the most important? Why did you come today? Yeah. And, and so these are things, it challenges me, and perhaps it also challenges you, right? But it's things that... God had to remind the people of, right? And, and, and so we have to look at these things the same way. Now, where they come to some agreement here, they don't say, let's forget completely about the Old Testament law. Okay? But they do, they do come to an agreement. What are the things we want to focus on? 
What's the most important piece? What is really the reason for these Old Testament laws? Okay? So keep that in mind as we read just a little bit further. Right? Let's go verse 20. So here's the suggestion. But that we write unto them, that they abstain from pollutions of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. So there's a suggestion that comes to the floor. Right? Somebody says, stand up, they speak. Right? People listen. There's a suggestion that comes to the floor. Well, why don't we write to the Christians in Antioch that from the Mosaic Law, here are four things that we believe it's important for you to adhere to. Okay? We want you to adhere to these laws from the Old Testament. Okay? Now, why these four? Well, if we look at them carefully, Right? Before, actually, maybe we look at them carefully. <clears throat> These four laws were designed to, first of all, decrease the differences between the Jewish Christ uh, Christians and the Gentiles who had become Christians. Okay? So God understands, and we need to understand today, the need for unity. Okay? And not for division. Unity is so critical. Now, I'm a strong proponent, and I'm changing gears here a little bit, you know. But I grew up a Canadian. I happened to be born in Canada, right? But my mom and dad, who came after World War II as teenagers to Canada, I never heard them speak of themselves as German Canadians. Now, they never put down their heritage, and I'm proud of my heritage, very proud of my heritage as you should be as well. But first and foremost, I'm a Canadian. And I personally have a lot of trouble when I hear people describe themselves as, you know, a something Canadian. Let's, how about just being Canadians? And the difficulty, I, the reason I point out that example is because unfortunately I see and we hear a lot of that in the church as well. See, God designed, God says, we are to be Christians. The problem that we have today is there's so many different kinds of Christians. And every time we talk about a different kind of Christian, we're talking about a division. And those divisions weaken God's kingdom, what God really wants to see. He wants to see Christians worshiping together, serving God together, following what he has said, here's the book, here's the way it's supposed to happen. Not division. Okay. You know, so you don't come into the church and say, I'm a right side pew Christian. Or I'm a left side pew Christian, based on where you sit. Again, a silly example, right? But that's what you've thought, right? Oh, I'm a baptism by immersion Christian. Oh no, I'm a baptism by sprinkling Christian. And I'm a this and I'm a that, right? God doesn't want to see any of that. I believe he just wants us all to be able to say truthfully, I'm a Christian. And what that means is being born again. So often we'll say, and I, I understand this by necessity, because there's so much confusion about what a Christian is, you know, we have to remind people, no, I'm a Christian according to the scripture, I'm a born again Christian, because God says we have to be born again. <clears throat> so we, we've had to define that, right? But the other definitions that we have, you know, even like I grew up, I'm a, I'm a Lutheran. Well, who, for somebody who doesn't know, what, what is a Lutheran? Is that somebody who believes in the Bible? Like, you know, in our society, we would know that. But other people wouldn't know that. If I go someplace in Africa, and I'll just pick on Africa as a, as a choice, and I go to some country and I say, I'm a Lutheran, Oh, what do you worship? 
You worship Luther? Like, you know, what, what does that mean? Far better to be able to say, I'm a Christian. Right? So, these divisions, they shouldn't be there. So, what now these laws, I'm going to have to go quickly, but what they're designed to do is both decrease the division between the Gentiles and the Jews, and increase, there is one division we have to have, increase the division between God's children and the unsaved. That division should be obvious. Okay? And that's another area today that we have concerns about. Okay? So what does he say? Very quickly. The first one was with regards to, he says, abstain from the pollutions of idols. <coughs> Excuse me. What he's talking about there was at the time, it was common practice for after sacrifices had been made, the meat would be sold. Okay? So people would come in, and, and from Old Testament law, they came, they gave their sacrifice, you know, the bullock or whatever it happened to be, the priests took what they were allowed to take, and then they sold the rest on the street, maybe in front of the, I don't know, in front of the tabernacle, I have no idea where. Okay? All right? And that was something that was not to happen. Okay? Because there was a tendency for people to worship the meat that had been used as a sacrifice. Right? So the meat became holy, so to speak, and then people treated that again almost like a god. And so under Mosaic law, that was not to happen. And here they said, let's extend that to the Gentiles so that they are not going out there to buy this meat. Okay? And so that was something, because that would bring them closer together as a people, and it would separate them from those that were doing that. All right, this, the whole idea of the sexual immorality, like for us to be morally clean, that's, that's a kind of a no-brainer, right? But again, remember, pagan religions of the time, sexual immorality was part of their rituals, right? So they, the pagan religions, many of them, I mean, they promoted prostitution. They promoted sexual activity outside of marriage. And so a reminder to the Gentiles, you have to leave that behind. And a reminder to the Jewish people as well, and to us. We're not part of that. Okay? The idea of not eating, as it says here, uh, a rather interesting one, it says, uh, and from things strangled. And really, this idea of, and from things strangled and from blood, they're connected, okay? So, in Old Testament Mosaic Law, things had to be bled out, okay? And the idea was, in a sense, you make sure that the animal is dead, okay? And so, something that you eat that's been strangled, it's... It, it's not, hasn't died the same way, hasn't been butchered the same way, okay? And so the abstinence of eating the blood of animals was both a health sort of reasoning, and many things that God put into place were because he wants to keep his people healthy, both naturally, but again, pagan rituals were big on the consumption of blood. So can you see God, even in the Old Testament, was looking to separate his people from all of these pagan rituals, because we are to be separate, right? When it says, touch not the unclean thing, it's not just talking about alcohol. It's talking about all of these things that are unclean, okay? So the idea was to separate God's people from those that were not believing and to bring God's people closer together. Okay, in closing... Basically, what you see now in the rest of this part of Scripture is that, and this is critical, maybe I, I do need to go here, verse um, 22, then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church, and that's where I want to stop, okay? Everybody was in agreement. Wow, isn't that nice? Everybody comes into this place of agreement. How does that happen? How does that happen? I believe there's only one way that can happen. And that's if everybody in the church 
is connected to the same spirit. Everybody hears from God. Okay? Everybody believes that what is coming from the leadership is what God has ordained to be the way it's supposed to be. Okay? And so there wasn't dissension. There wasn't, you know, and because that is also destructive. We have to understand how destructive that is, right? I mean, when a group of people, and anybody who's worked in the world, you understand this. When a group of people have disagreement, and then they say, okay, let's do this, okay, we're going to do this, but there's still a couple people that are not in the same spirit. Often those people that are not in the same spirit, what do they do? They go out and they murmur, and they complain, and they go in this corner, in that corner, and again, that is damaging, okay, right? And so what has to happen is God's Spirit has to come in and has to speak to everybody, to me, to you, right? There are those times when God says to me, you were wrong. You did this wrong, you shouldn't have said that. I get a spanking from the Lord. And when I was a young Christian, and Pastor Mary called me into the office, I got a spanking from the Lord. Not from Pastor Mary. And I suppose I could have stood up and I could have said, Pastor Mary, I don't believe this, and you're da 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 And I could have been rude and all of those kind of things. Right? Disrespectful. And that would have only happened if I had not heard from the Lord speaking. If I only heard Pastor Mary speaking, I could have said, you're not my mom. You know, I hear kids say that sometimes. To other you're not my mom. You're not, you can't tell me what to do. Wait a minute. Who's talking to us? God can absolutely tell me what to do. Okay? And I need to listen if I'm going to be a Christian. Right? So they were all in one accord, to put it bluntly. They go back to the people in Antioch with this letter from the church, which points out that there were some people that came from us, and that's in verse 24. We're, we're sorry, we heard there were people who came from us who troubled you. But we're correcting the matter. And now we've sent this letter, and we, by God's Spirit, are in agreement. These are the things that you need to adhere to. Four. Not all of these, like, they, they had hundreds. And even today, they have all these different rules and regulations, right? And the people rejoiced, it says in the scripture. They rejoiced. Because, again, they've been set free from a burden, right? Remember, they were all confused and worried. Oh, do I have to get circumcised now? Do I not have to get circumcised? What's my status? Right? What, what am I... And, and, you know, they, they were young Christians, and that happens to young Christians. And so here, they received verifications, right? And I close with one, uh, verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Who sent them? The Holy Ghost. Seemed good to us by the Holy Ghost and to us. And so let us do the same. May we do the same, right? To always look to the Lord, acknowledge when we've made a mistake, but ask God, right? What would you have us to do? And then to be in unity 